Welcome to the stream. One second, and I'll get you a picture of myself. There I am. Welcome to the stream. This is Live Free or Die Bard. Uh, we are on episode 13, Painting Props and Tinkering with Terrain Pieces. Huzzah! Welcome back, Digital Prophet. One of our loyal returning subjects to the kingdom of musical puns, which is Live Free or Die Bard. Episode 13, we are approaching the end of... Can't see the hat? Let me make some adjustments. I set up a new... Uh, there you go. New camera set up so that we can do some crafting today. So, got that. Got the feather in there. Make sure it's nice and pointy. <laughs> and, uh... So, yeah, we're... we're uh, we're getting ready to do some some tabletop props and some uh, scatter terrain and things like that. Yes, I'm. Oh yeah, I am. You're right. Hang on. There we go. Looking at the wrong screen there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, slightly new setup because I have to adjust my webcams and laptop cams. Also, uh, the microphone is slightly farther away from my face than normal. So if it's uh, so, I made some adjustments there. If it's too loud or too soft, let me know in the chat. And I'll make adjustments. All right. Um, where shall we start episode 13? We've got one episode left before the Thanksgiving break when we're going to do a little bit of rearranging of the schedule. Uh, so next episode will be the one where we're finishing off our Adventure 1 completely, making it look ship shape and good. Uh, this one we're doing some props. Uh, where are we so far? What have we done? Live for your die bard is our... Uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons campaign for those of you who are new. Uh, we're making it from scratch. We're making it on Obsidian Portal. Uh, let me get you the web address, which should be above this other thing here. There we go. We'll get there eventually. It's uh, livefreeordiebar.obsidianportal.com. That's our web page that we've got going on where we're keeping all of our GM notes. Uh, the link is in the chat right now. Thank you, Mod. And you can go there and check out what we've done so far. Uh, you can also check out some of our videos in the VOD if you want to see what we've done already. Uh, any of the ones that are not there that you're looking for are at our YouTube channel, which you can search for. I think we have links somewhere <coughs> in the vicinity. Um, so let's get started. Before we get to the props and things like that. I want to go over where we where we are. Let me make this go away for a second. Okay. Here's our Obsidian Portal page. Live for your die bard. This is your front page that we're looking at. We have uh, nearly completed our first adventure, Act 1, Chapter 1, Adventure 1, Take Me Down to Paradise City. We are getting ready to make some stuff for that. But I noticed uh, recently uh, someone favorited or fanned my campaigns. We got we got a fan uh, over here on the right-hand side of the screen. If you go to someone's front page of their campaign, there's a little heart. You can become a fan of their page, and we got one from Gianca1 has been a member of OP since 2011, a long time. Uh, so just to let you know, when you do fan someone, uh, they get a little, the, the GM of that campaign gets a little message. Um, they get uh, points, basically, to make them more visible to other people who are looking for popular campaigns, uh, things like that. And if you get enough fans, you get noticed. You might even get something like, campaign of the month or a feature in the newsletter something along those lines so we appreciate the fan the little heart Gianca one uh, this is the profile page for Gianca one if you ever want to go check out and see who has given you accolades uh, you go to their profile page it has all the campaigns they have participated in uh, as a player or a GM the public ones and um, you can write a little bio for yourself uh, you can put in your um, if you have a website, you've got campaigns that you've favorited, 
you've got friends, you've got friends activities, etc, etc. So we appreciate that. I uh, wanted to look at one of uh, Gianca One's campaigns that they made. This is a sort of standard D&D campaign. He's, he or she has done a cool little trick down here. Um, and uh, put an image in, here in their front page that contains all the stuff laid out the way that they wanted. Uh, if you don't feel like doing all the custom work, the CSS stuff, and, and doing it that way, you can make a nice big image, lay it out the way you want. Quick and easy. Very, very efficient way to do that. Uh, pretty good little campaign here. I've already flipped through it. Uh, this is an old one, has not been updated in a long time, so a lot of the newer features on OP are not on here. Uh, but I did want to show my appreciation for that. Uh, fan by fanning right back so I'm becoming a fan click and now Junka one will get a message that they have been appropriately appreciated all right uh, a couple other things that we haven't talked about in a little while I wanted to make sure that you guys knew about before we get into the painting and sanding and miniatures and whatnot um, there's some other features over here on the left hand side if you've been watching for a while you may not have seen them use yet I wanted to point them out very briefly uh, one of them is the uh, campaign forums uh, campaign forums are basically just a message board kind of a situation you can make new forum topics and then uh, type in your thing and then all of you and all of your co GMs and players and whatnot can can see what's going on in your forums you can do play by post games this way if you want to we're actually getting ready to start one up pretty soon uh, for a play by post haven't done one of those for a while since like college, which was super fun. But uh, so it's a nice, easy way to do that, and you've got all the functionality of uh, the rest of the site on here too. So you can put your links in. Uh, there's a new dice roll beta section, so you can uh, you can do dice rolls that are uh, they've got they've got some cheat proofing on there, things like that. DM fudge rules if you need them. You can count successes and do that sort of thing. It's still in beta, so we're we're still. Uh, refining that so if you get a chance you can try that out there's also a uh, calendar uh, feature we don't have anything in here right now but you can make new calendar events uh, for example uh, Thanksgiving is coming up so if I wanted to I believe I could add a new event Thanksgiving oops alternate stream schedule and then we put in our date for start ends on the same day and have it start at 11 a.m. which is when my stream starts and go to about let's say 1.30 my stream normally ends it's online Oops. Alternate holiday stream schedule is my description. You can have reminders if you want to send your people a reminder in advance. Uh, I don't. <clears throat> and then we will create. Oops, I missed one. What did I miss? Error creating my event. Uh, starts at must be before in the oh I did my in there wrong sorry whoops whoops make sure I got that try again there we go and they created now we got our little thing there that's handy for if you're playing with online people who you don't talk to on the regular uh, if you have an, a variable schedule for example my gaming group meets on Friday nights uh, we often have if a couple of people are out, we can cancel and put it up here, that sort of thing. Handy little feature, calendar. Uh, all right, let's get into it. Um, so, for those of you in the chat, thank you for being here. Uh, feel free to contribute at any point as we are uh, going through this adventure. If you see any potential opportunity to add puns 
or uh, puns that I have missed for musical puns, please feel free to do so. Let's go over where we've been so far, what we've got going on, and what kind of cool stuff we're going to make to make this more interesting. Uh, this is our overview for our adventure. We've got coming into Paradise City. For two tickets to Paradise, we've got our descriptions that our players will see as they come in. They see a little vignette of the main plot line, which is uh, the Church of Rhea is magically branding citizens taking away their magical powers uh, with with an artifact item <clears throat> uh, at some point the players who are level one at this point will get introduced to uh, Priscilla the innkeeper of the heartbreak who wants them to do a very standard D&D cliche mission which is go hunt the rats down in the cellar of my inn in return she will give them uh, free room and board while they're there. So that should be a good incentive. Um, we could make some terrain scatter terrain. If you're thinking about making terrain stuff and props and things, miniatures for games, uh, you could make some in furniture if you wanted to lay that out. Um, generally, I save most of my stuff for important scenes because it does take a little while to put together. Uh, here's some combat. we got some rats. Um, if you're looking to make little miniatures that you don't want to buy them, I recommend um, air dry clay or sculpy clay or something like that. You can make little teeny tiny people and little rats and stuff like that. You can also use whatever game pieces you want out of your board game collection. Uh, some of my friends purchased a whole bunch of official Dungeons & Dragons miniatures at one point. So our group has a pretty big collection going on. Uh, let's see, once they are down fighting rats, they find a temple underneath the city, a dungeon, which they have access to. We let them explore a little chunk of the dungeon. We have cut off access to the full dungeon. Uh, they find a way out of the city. They find a little puzzle and a little trap. Nothing too deadly because they're still level one and this is game one. And they find a small shrine. And within the shrine, uh, they will find our little prop that I showed uh, a little bit earlier. This is a, uh, a scale, a creature's scale that has been fashioned into uh, a kind of key, which we'll talk about once we start painting that here in a little bit. Um, got a little more exploration, another fight. Uh, they find a few of the clues about why this place is down here and why it was sealed up and abandoned and they find a way to get into the mansion that will come into play in the second half the third half or third uh, third section the white wedding section uh which is our role-playing section this is where they meet uh, another npc called evie nix she explains that she's being forced to marry begs for help getting out of it and gives them tickets to the wedding, which is happening at the same time as a masquerade ball. Uh, they have to figure out a way to get inside. Perhaps they uh, try and earn their way in as a band, if they are playing musical type folks uh, or other entertainers. They can try stealth, they can try fast talking, they can try several different things. Uh, here's our little mini map that we made uh, a couple of times ago, our isometric view of the mayor's mansion. We got some descriptions for the important spots where the final battle is going to take place. Uh, our climax with this guy, Baron Brad to the bone, who has a stutter. All right, <clears throat> here we've got a couple of a little stat block we've got going on, and then uh, some concluding material. So that's what we have so far for our adventure one. Uh, when you're doing, making your props and things for your adventures, you will need to think about what's going to be an effective use of your time. Uh, where can you get the most bang for your buck? So obviously for us, we needed to do our little prop. So I think we should go ahead and wrap that up. Let me bring up my... All right, here's our little... 
prop thing here. Let me get it so that you guys can, can see it okay. Uh, this is a new setup for me. Let me get this web address out of the way too. Get a little more field of view. <clears throat> All right, so this is the prop that we made before. This is made out of fairly thin uh, foam core, foam board. It has a paper backing on both sides. Um, you can find this kind of stuff at dollar stores, any kind of craft stores, things like that. It's a really good, useful material. Very stiff stuff. Uh, you can make walls. You can make furniture. You can make all kinds of props out of this stuff. Uh, and then we've taken a small implement, like uh, a little pin or something like that, and we have made an impression. I think it's called embossing, technically. Uh, into the soft material, but we haven't pushed too far so we don't puncture it. And we've done a little drawing of a sitar on this one. So I think we should uh, perhaps paint it up and make it look nice. So let me get my paints out here. Uh, so I was thinking these are gonna, we have uh, uh, keys basically, uh, is what these are for a later thing. There's nothing on the back of this one right now. I have folded it slightly to make it curvy so that it represents a, an animal's scale. This is a handout that we will be handing out to our players, a little prop so they have something to work with. And then later on, when they go to the Masquerade Ball, they will find other people have these. They're wearing them around their necks as sort of a badge of pride. So let me get some paints. I think this one ought to be, uh, let's make it, let's make it a red color. Let me find my red here. So what I'm using, um, are just some cheapy acrylic paints. You do not need to go crazy with any of this stuff. Um, you can get these for like a buck or two, depending on where you are. And just a cheap brush. I'm not doing anything really all that fancy. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials online if you are looking for <clears throat> Um, how to learn how to do this. I recommend digging around online. There are lots of people who do this stuff really well. I'm, by the way, I'm putting this in a little dish so I have that to work with. That will just be off camera. I'm going to wet my brush. The brush that I'm using is just a kind of generic brush. You may want to find a smaller one than this. I'm not doing a ton of detail work today. So I'm just going to use my little junk brush and what I want to do here is just kind of do a little bit of a base coat. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. It probably take way too long, but I'll, I'll show you uh, just sort of process. So I want to get most of this thing covered in sort of a base coat of this red. And, sorry, my hand is getting right where the camera is. So we'll come in from the other side, that might be easier. Slightly move this around. So these are the octave keys. There are going to be eight of them eventually. In fact, it might be good to indicate to your players whenever you're finding a set of things without telling them it's a set of things. You can indicate to them somehow visually that there's more that they should be looking for without straight up telling them or giving them like a journal entry or something like that to read. Uh, and I think I can do that right now, actually. So let's put in, now that I think about it, Let's put in some, let's do Roman numerals. <clears throat> uh, let's make this lucky number seven. Let me line this up so you guys can see it straight. And we'll just make it, let's maybe do it down here at the bottom so it's a little more subtle. Let's see if you guys can see that, uh, okay. And we'll do, I'm just embossing the 
Roman numerals in here. It's kind of a medium pressure, this little stylus pen tool. You can use something like a mechanical pencil without the lead. Uh, any kind of small implement, kind of a rounded over toothpick perhaps. And then just use the edge to kind of widen it. I'll make a little thing down here. So this way they know as soon as they find this in the dungeon that there are other ones. And for the explorer types, which is one of our character archetypes that we're keeping track of, there we go. Now, let me go over that. All right, let me divvy out some more paint here. So I find that the best use of props and game terrain and things like that, if you are short on time, let's say you're making stuff week to week, is to only do the really critical stuff. Things like puzzles and traps, always good because they have a visual aid. Your players will appreciate that, especially the ones who are playing late at night after a long work week and uh, may not have enough caffeine in their system. Any kind of visual aids and manipulatives that you can give them are handy. Oops, trying to get in the frame here. So I would uh, concentrate on those and then save the rest for just verbal descriptions. Anything complicated, uh, for example, one time I made a puzzle box for a Star Wars game. It was a, uh, a code breaking machine kind of thing. And it had, it's basically made out of heavy cardboard stuff. And it had buttons and dials and whatnot all around the outside. And uh, it was their job to play with it to try and get it open without blowing up the bomb that was in there. And if I recall correctly, they even used uh, Jedi force power stuff against it to try and manipulate it without touching it. <clears throat> but it was complex enough that it was worth doing a prop for worth spending the time and that's my suggestion if you are limited on time to just focus on that happy little props it's your world we don't make mistakes And I need another couple drops of paint. With this acrylic stuff, um, with this light coat, I'm not going heavy on this because we're going to put other stuff over top of it. Uh, it dries pretty quickly with a thin layer. As you can see. And of course, if you're going for like a deep red color, you can let this dry to a second coat. You can just put more paint on. It'll be a little splotchy. We're not worried about that right now. Lots of different paint effects you can do. If you're looking for uh, a really good um, folks online who do this kind of stuff more often than I do, that I learned from. I marathoned. Oops, you see that? There we go. I marathoned a bunch of their videos. Uh, you can start with the DM's Craft on YouTube. 
That's a really good one. He kind of was the first one to do all this stuff online anyway, or one of the first ones. Uh, from there, you can go to somebody like Black Magic Craft, Wylox Crafting Bids. All these guys are well worth looking up. Uh, let's get me engines here. They've got all kinds of little painting tricks and techniques, uh, different materials to work with, lots of different game prop ideas that you can use, uh, how to modify miniatures, how to make stuff out of really crazy cheap materials. Like all the stuff I'm using here is almost completely free because uh, I got the foam board for free and then the paint was like a buck. One more drop of paint. This is very red. So if this were a prop that they were not going to see for more than like one scene, if this was going to be just a little generic something to help them out and then they get rid of it, I would say don't bother wasting more than a half hour, 45 minutes on making it. <clears throat> but I'm washing my brush out in between colors. But on the other hand, uh, these guys are going to be keeping this for multiple game sessions. So I want to make it look at least decent. All right, from here you can uh, you, we can touch it up in different ways. I'm going to make the edges look slightly different than this. So I want this to be possibly from a red dragon, if they figure that out. Uh, red dragons, if you are not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, beat the devil out of it. <laughs> Good old Bob, Bob Ross. It actually does work. <laughs> I'm making a mess, but I won't. Um, I do a little orange paint. I'll try and get some color effects going on here. Or some, a uh, little bit of a gradient around the edges. Let's see if this works here. Yeah, we're putting a little orange in. This is not going to show up well on the camera until I do the yellow bit that goes after it. Uh, I'm going to need a little more paint than that. Nice big blob of paint. So, <clears throat> it's kind of a um, how much time do you want to spend, how much time can you spend on this stuff, but your players will pick up on how much time you have spent. That's a little bit better. Still can't see that. I do not have any kind of cool color correction on my webcam, so this will not show up well. But it'll pop in real life. So, for example, if I spend uh, a couple of hours making a prop, the players will either intentionally or unintentionally, sort of assume that it is worth more of their time also. So if you spend a bunch of time on something that's a throwaway, they might accidentally sort of uh, decide, like, oh, we, we haven't found out all we need to know about this. Obviously, there's more to it, because he wouldn't have spent time making the prop. So you may shoot yourself in the foot that way. So keep that in mind also. It's not really metagaming, it's just sort of natural to assume, like, hey, you spend a lot of time describing this. This is it's probably critical. Yeah, this is almost done, and then we can go to a color that you guys can see better. Also, try not to get paint on my hands. Uh, a couple other video recommendations. I would say if you can find anything from... 
Uh, basically, if you search for anybody on YouTube that has cat crafter and game or some combination thereof in the name, uh, you're going to be set. All right, that's pretty good. Let me wash this out. And we'll do a little bit of yellow and see how that turns out. So you won't be able to tell from my camera shot, but um, I did just the edges and I kind of brushed inward in such a way that it's sort of kind of easy to well, shake up the paint. Uh, it kind of looks like flames on the side of my face. Wipe it off. We'll beat the devil out of it. <laughs> Good old Bob knew what he was doing. All right, let's see if you guys can see this a little bit even better. All right, so this is um, this is a wet blending kind of technique. So the orange paint underneath is still a little bit wet. So anything you put on top of it will kind of mix together just a touch. Let me give you this little effect. This is not really what flames look like, but it's close enough. And uh, as always, this acrylic paint, especially as it dries, it will change slightly in color, make it a slightly darker version of this. Some things may pop in contrast a little bit differently, so experimentation is always good. Yeah, that's showing up a little bit better. I think you can see that better on the camera than I can with my actual eyeballs. Strange. Again, smaller brush, you can get smaller, finer details. We're not too worried about it for this. Because we're going to go back over it later on with a bit of a wash to kind of knock it down. But this is the first uh, sort of special item that they will receive in the campaign. This is helping us hook our players into our meta plot. So it does need some attention. We need them to care about it. And this is one of the ways that you make them care about you. I mean, your game. <laughs> if they care enough to show up, they already care about it. <laughs> so I've mentioned this before. Uh, some of you in chat already know. But pretty much everybody GMs in my group and we kind of have an ongoing competition about who can make who can out nerd the rest of the nerds and come up with the coolest props and things so far we've had some pretty good ones uh, there's been like a burned leather map and it's been all kinds of interesting maps made. All kinds of uh, little cardboard props, things like that. Player handouts to the extreme. The game we're getting ready to start has a player handout that probably took, I don't know, like 50 hours to put together and a lot of money. <laughs> There's custom videos with it there's digital downloads there's like a usb drive i mean i showed it on another stream but yeah i'm pretty excited about that one all right so that's our outer edge kind of stuff going on i need to let that one dry before we do our wash but basically the next step would be uh we can paint the sitar in the center 
and then actually we can do that now there's not too much on there that's still wet um and then we'll do a wash a wash is basically watered down paint that you use to get into the cracks and crevices which we created i think i have i do i have some metallic gold paint which we'll use for the sitar So in interest of time management, while this one dries, we can work on our next little project and show you some of the other stuff. The goal of the stream really is to show you a handful of techniques. There we go. A little bit of gold in there. Don't have to go crazy with it. This would be when a smaller brush would be slightly handier, but... not cleaned up my craft room in a while craft room slash office slash place where we dump things uh, so couldn't find any smaller ones but this one will do you don't have to spend a lot of money on this stuff if you don't want to uh, yeah other video recommendations um, there's a guy called uh, it's Quasi's Bell Tower on YouTube, it's Q-U-A-S-S-I, quasi. He's got some cool stuff. There's a guy called uh, Landvetter. It's L-A-N-D-V-A-E-T-T-R. Uh, that's another one. I don't know if he's put out anything new in a while. I haven't checked. But he had some pretty cool stuff. In terms of terrain crafting, there's a bunch of model railroad guys who are outstandingly good. There's a couple people that do dioramas that have a lot of cool techniques for making stuff. Uh, the Crafting Muse, uh, there's a bunch of... Actually, the, the theme song that I use for my intro and outro uh, came from a crafting video. That's where I saw it the first time. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, we do need to let that dry before we do our black wash. I do a brown wash, since it's reds and golds and stuff. But that's the prop so far. So let's work on another prop while we wait. So eventually there, there are going to be uh, eight of these octave keys. Octave is eight. Put my paints away. So, um, we need to make another one. So I'll make one from scratch to show you the process if you were not here for the stream where I did it the first time. Uh, so you can look at that one. Here's our little chunk of foam board, sturdy stuff. Whatever you can get, you can do this with cardboard or something else too. Uh, I have pre-measured about how big of a slab that I need. And I'm just going to cut it with some See if I can get on camera here. Some fairly sturdy scissors can cut this stuff. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, an X-Acto knife on your craft board and run it over there a couple times, score it, kind of bend it, break it off, crunch. This stuff's real sturdy. Uh, if you get stuff from like the dollar store, it'll be a little weaker and you can also peel off the backing paper from some brands if you need the foam which would also be a neat texture if you wanted to use that. Alright, so now I've got my little square. I'm going to cut it roughly into another shield shape. I'm going to make it slightly different from the previous shield shape. Uh, but let me, uh, what would be the best way to do this? Here, I'll move this guy over while he's drying. this roughly on camera. I'm going to sketch this out with a pencil. If I can find a working pencil. Here's one. Uh, 
Okay. I'm just going to sort of freehand draw this. And then later when they go to use the octave keys, uh, there'll be different shaped holes for them that hopefully they will uh, sort of figure out where things go. Trying to make it as symmetrical as possible without it being perfect because these are natural kind of things. And I'll do kind of a rough shape like that. That looks pretty good. Kind of demon head in nature. All right, now just trim off the excess with your sturdy scissors. So I don't have the puzzle planned for the octave keys yet, uh, but I know that there will be some sort of puzzle, riddle, something or other to make it function. What they do is they open the door uh, that the Temple of the Muses was using to guard their uh, super weapon, which is a giant pipe organ underneath the city where we're adventuring. A uh, giant magical pipe organ. And uh, when they abandoned the temple, when they had to leave, basically they sealed up that door, spread the keys out and hid them. Some of them got stolen and traded over time. This is going to be a little more difficult. Okay, with these little cuts, I think I will use the exacto knife because it'll be easier to get them with the big giant scissors. Can I get that out? But basically, they will have to find all of these keys in order to open up this door, which gets them into the rock organ. If by that point they have uh, stolen uh, the magic item, which is the conductor's baton. It's a staff with a gem on it that the Church of Rhea is using to take people's magical powers away. If they have taken that, then they can plug that into the machine and they will uh, be able to use the organ as they desire. The organ itself, as we know, it'll be a secret from regular players, but for our purposes, we already know. The organ is actually a, a, a weapon and it's incredibly loud and whoever hears it is, uh, has their magic stripped away. So hopefully, if things go according to plan, uh, they will realize, once they put two and two together, the players will realize that uh, this Temple of Muses, who we presented as possibly the oppressed good guys, actually were not necessarily good guys. It'll be a nice turn in the plot. So maybe they were sympathizing with them. Yeah, so basically, yeah, it's just paper, foam, paper. So you may have to cut in from both sides to get that. All right, let's clean up our workspace. And then here's our little scale that we made for the next scale that we need. Put the knife away. All right, so let's do our technique again, where we are, let me sketch it out first. So where I want to put my embossed lines, I'm going to make another little border like this one. Hopefully this shows up just enough in the camera that you can actually see it. So I'm thinking since the players will have one of these scales, uh, when they start, 
the game, when they go into the first dungeon, they will receive as a reward from Evie Nix, if they rescue her, they will receive her family's scale. Let's make this roughly like so. That's pretty good. Not exactly symmetrical. Go over just a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. At least not for my games. That's, my players know better. Uh, let's make this one a liar. L Y R E. The subtitle of the game is A Song of Dice and Liars, so. See if I can just freehand draw this without looking up what a liar looks like. Might make that a little bigger, actually. I'm gonna take up more real estate on the field of view here. Let's let me make that more center. a little tricky but remember these are ancient artifacts and uh, maybe they're just weathered over time can we use that as an excuse <laughs> Call correctly, actual liars have different pieces uh, than this, but this is symbolic. Remember, because the Temple of the Muses is all about sort of the symbolic and uh, inspiration and things. Kind of like that looks good. And then we'll do a couple of. Couple of these guys. That'll work. It's getting the paint over top of it, so it doesn't have to be perfect. All right, let's do our embossing trick. Uh, I use a little style. This is just a a pin that I have retracted the pin portion of. So uh, just like the last time we did this, you want to go in with sort of a what I call a rough cut, maybe just using the edge of the little pin thing or whatever your implement happens to be. Maybe you've got some clay sculpting tools, something like that. You're just going to want to go in and mark a hard edge, and then we're going to go back in with a different angle on the tool or a different tool altogether and kind of open it up. So it's a little more broad. Again, I'm putting some pressure on here, but if you start to feel the paper breaking away, that's a little too much pressure. I don't want to pierce the paper all the way into the foam. If it happens, it's not a huge deal, but the goal is just to get a little bit of an impression going. If you find spots where you need to correct, you can just do that. So there's that and then you can come in either with the tip of this thing to try and open it up or with another tool um, I think the tail end of my paintbrush it's nice and soft that might give me even even better impression yeah I can 
feel as I push. It's just starting to almost break the paper. You can almost hear it. That's why I want to stop applying more pressure and just open up what's there. So we'll go around like that and make our indentation. Or embossing, I think. Is embossing the other one? I don't really know all the terms. But you can do this with foam core. Um, it would not work quite as well on cardboard, but you could get a slight impression. You just have to be more careful about punching through to the corrugated paper underneath. You could use some fairly thick paper and um, put a soft material underneath of that, um, like a like a rubber mat or something like that, and attempt to do the same thing with that. Uh, you can also, I think if you wet the paper, it makes it slightly easier to make impressions. Uh, but you'll have to experiment with that one. I have not tried that technique yet. Now we'll go around the outer edges of our lyre. So in our world, technology is around the Renaissance era, which on Earth would have had you know, things like harpsichords, you would have been approaching the era of electricity in, uh, I think things like the theremin and things like that um, were on the horizon in reality. But for our world, where music and magic are intricately tied together, uh, people have figured out much more advanced instruments. So you do have things like lightning powered guitars which can also be used as axes you have things like uh, organs and rock organs uh, much more modern feel feeling instruments kenny g style alto sax might make that a, some kind of an enemy. That'd be cool. <clears throat> but then, um, because your adventures, hopefully, if they are going the musical route with their characters, they will be combining their weapons and their musical instruments in such a way that they can have both at the same time and have both options when it comes to combat. <clears throat> and uh, a real simple rule for how to do that would be to, if you want something out of the book that is a weapon plus instrument, uh, you can combine the two prices together, make a combo instrument weapon thing. Be a nice, quick, and easy rule for a game world where that exists. This is relaxing stuff. Again, doesn't have to be perfect. Anything your players can hold in their hands is going to be good. Does it make a difference if you do the design before adding the subtle curving to the overall scale? I feel like you put the curving in before the design last time. I'm wondering if the grooves from the design might impact the stability of the front while curving. That's a good point. Uh, I don't remember what order I did it in last time. But uh, yes, when we were talking about when we, when we, we went to bend. It's not a good way to 
show this. We want to bend this so that it has a bit of a curve so it feels more like a scale. Uh, yes, this will affect your stability, so maybe do this, do the curving first. That's a good point. Uh, I lost track of where it was. Um, luckily, my players are very forgiving about badly made props, so if I do break one, I'll turn it into a story thing and pretend like I did it on purpose. So if one of these cracks, maybe it becomes a separate item, and there's a whole separate side quest to find the... Uh, the special material you need to put it back together and then I look like uh, like I'm brilliant which has been uh, sort of what I've been doing for the past couple of decades screw up and, uh, and pretend that you did it on purpose but that is a good point think about your steps ahead of time if something does go wrong it's a happy little accident you meant it that way the whole time. Bob Ross. Okay, let's open this guy up a little bit more. I don't mind if these are a little tighter. It will give a different impression. Then the outer edges. So yeah, our goal for all these octave keys is that they are our MacGuffin, our special item that you have to get from about levels one through five. So all of our lower levels, these will be the special for that. We may give them some mystical magical powers later on down the road but that looks pretty good right there okay let's do a little paint what do you guys think uh, green dragon blue dragon life lessons with jinx this needs some good 70s elevator music to go with that instead of what i got planned <laughs> okay um so yeah we can do the bending uh while you guys think about what color you want blues greens whatever whatever kind of dragon whatever your favorite dragon is Shout it out in the track in the chat and we'll make it that color. So I'm gonna very gently try and give myself a little bit of a crease. Very light pressure. You're compressing the foam on the inside a little bit. There it goes. I'm gonna feel it start to bend, just go real slow. What we're going for is a uh, just a slight curve. You won't be able to even see it on camera, really. Probably till I'm done. Maybe you can hear it. There it goes. And like I said, if you do break it, then it becomes some part of its history. I was like, oh, this is where uh, one of the heroes who was wearing it around their neck on uh, a chain, got into a battle, it got slashed with the axe of, I don't know, the great Bromstein. And uh, the hero did not survive, obviously, Bromstein. But this is all that was left of him after the flames died away. All right, so there you go. We've given it a little bit of a curve. This stuff's pretty sturdy, so it, it did not break. Uh, the cheaper dollar store kind of stuff might might snap on you. So just a heads up there. Okay, so that's our thing there. Any uh, any votes in the chat for uh, what color you want this one to be? You know, green dragon, blue dragon. Uh, blue! There's one for blue. Let's do blue. 
All right, so for blues, I want to do kind of a similar thing as we did on our red, where we have a, a gradient, a little bit of a gradient. I'm going to do some blues and purples. Let's see what kind of blue stuff I have. That's a nice purple. We got some, looks like turquoise. This is the part where Bob Ross talks about all of his cool old school colors. We got some straight up blue we're going to use. And we got some purple. So we're going to do a little, let's see if we can actually get it in the shot there. The turquoise, a bright blue, and a purple. We'll do our little color gradient thing. So let me move these guys out of the way. And then I have, I think I have some silver metallic paint that we can use to highlight the liar because I think silver would work well. All right, let's do a base coat of this turquoise. I got my little painty thing here. So we'll do this guy, and while this guy's drying, I'll show you how to do the black wash on the other prop <clears throat> so we can get all those little cracks, crevices to show up. doll of the paint. Clean brush. Get into it. Again, we're going for a thin layer. We're going to put some other stuff over top of it so it does not have to be Perfect in every way. And then after we do these props, we'll work on a little bit of scatter terrain. I'll show you a couple basics of that if you've never done it before. By scatter terrain, I mean stuff that you can scatter onto your table at a moment's notice for whatever situation you have to find yourself in as a GM. This particular adventure is planned out with the major scenes, but you may end up with a bunch of sections where your players go do something you weren't expecting. You may have to come up with an encounter in the middle of everything else where they've gone somewhere and you feel like they need to have an encounter. Sorry, this is a little off camera because I'm holding it up too high, but. There we go. Still see our embossed detail. So if you happen to have a little bit of scatter terrain in your game bag or at your location where you're playing, It'll make it significantly easier to make up something on the spot, which is like half of my campaigns. And it's like, ooh, that sounds like a good plan. Let's make, let's make that happen. This one looks like it was maybe torn off of the dragon, if it was a dragon at all. A little more violently than the last one. And again, later on, after the stuff's dried, if you see spots that need touching up, you just go back in with the same kinds of paints. Add a couple more dots in there and make it nice. Uh, another handy thing to do, especially for props that you need to last for a while, is to put uh, a clear coat on top of it. You want to go to 
any kind of hardware or paint store. You can get spray cans of clear coat sealer kind of stuff. You can look around, find what you want. Uh, if you want it to be shiny, you want gloss. If you want it to be a little bit shiny, you want semi-gloss. If you want it to not be shiny at all, you want matte. You have some other options too, but you'll have to read the can. Let me ask an associate at the hardware store. Tell them all about your game, what you're going to do. You might find an extra player that way. I'm way off camera, sorry about that. I'm holding it up where I can see it, which is not exactly where you can see it. There are some people that make entire YouTube careers out of nothing but this. I mean, they do it better than me, obviously, but... <laughs> okay, so there's our turquoise light blue color. Washing the brush out. We'll wipe it off. Beat the devil out of it. If I had a fan brush, I could really do the Bob Ross thing a little bit better. Okay, we're going to go to a slightly darker blue for some of our edges now. Same procedure as last time. Uh, what are blue dragons? Are those lightning? We might do a little bit of a lightning effect. Get my blue. Let's see if we can make this work. I'm just using a fairly light touch on this and then as the paint kind of runs off of the runs out I'll go in a little deeper from the border I'll give you sort of a fading effect This is one of those things that uh, watching somebody do it is all well and good, but to to actually learn it, you need to do it because a lot of it's just muscle memory. You get the feel for brushes, different kinds of paints, things like that. Totally worth it, though. Your players will freak out if you start doing this stuff. If they're not used to it. So other ways to be artistic at the game table. If you don't want to actually make physical props is the old index card route. You can draw a little picture of whatever the item is on index card write your descriptions on that and then when they find the special item you hand them the index card have them read it out loud if they want to It'd be kind of a neat little thing then you can have a whole stockpile of those but whenever you're ready to drop some treasure in the lap you can give them some cool stuff Okay, so again, as the paint's running out, I'm losing it from the brush, then I'm going in from the edge. It gives you a little bit of a fade, swirling it around, getting some unnatural brush strokes so it doesn't look like a little pattern. All right, let's wash that color off. Move on to the next one. This one we'll try and do is a purple. And I'll try and replicate a little bit of lightning crackles, which might be their first clue that these are dragon scales if they're clever and or experienced Dungeons and Dragons players. I haven't opened this one yet. 
I've had these for a while. I bought a big, um, it's kind of like a 12 pack, and then I got some metallic colors, but they ended up coming in about a buck a piece. Buck 25, something like that. I think, uh, any kind of craft store. Nice stuff. Okay, a little bit of purple. Same general idea, just less. Getting the paint a little bit wet. So we're doing a little bit of wet blending on the very, very edge. And then as the paint wears off, we bring it in, blend it together. Other options for this, if you can't get a hold of foam core, if you know how to do paper mache, you can do all kinds of cool shapes with paper mache. Uh, DM Scotty, he's the guy who does the DM's Craft YouTube channel, uh, has a toilet paper glue technique where you soak toilet paper in 50% white school glue, 50% water mold it around stuff and you can turn it into all kinds of cool things that are pretty durable you have to sometimes reapply another coat on top but not too bad okay we'll do our edges and then i'll do a little bit of lightning streaking stuff Sometimes when I am writing adventures, I will uh, have an idea for a prop before I have the idea for the adventure. So I go ahead and make the prop. And usually while you're making the prop, you come up with ways you can use it. Which is pretty, pretty fun. All right, there's that. Let's do a little bit of streaking so this particular brush as you can see is a little too big for very fine detail i could go find a little teeny tiny brush uh, if i really wanted to do this the correct way but i think what i'll do instead i've got some uh, you can use toothpicks if you wanted to i've got a little barbecue skewer here with a very pointy sharp tip I'm going to trim off a section of that with some big old scissors. Er, come here. All right. That's good. So now we have a section we can work with. We've made our own tool. Congratulations. And basically, just get the tip in here. And then we're going to draw some cool streaks. Can you guys see that from here? Coming out of purple. Remember our lyre section in the middle is going to be covered up. So you definitely could put something. Let's see if I can do this so you can see it. Going through there, if you wanted to, and fill it in. We've made ourselves sort of a primitive pin. This is how the settlers did it back in the old days. off 
whatever looks good to you. Get a couple over on this other side. And then we can work on our washes after we do the silver liar paint. That almost helps because I have to hold it at an unnatural angle to get it in here under the camera where you can see it, it almost helps me make these jagged shapes better. <laughs> There we go. I think that's pretty good. All right. Let's cover it up with silver. This is still a little bit wet, but it might be dry by the time we get the silver out and get it down there. Put this up here. Here's our blue dragon scale. Uh, where's my silver? Yep, so I've got some silver cheapy acrylic paint you got to shake the uh, metallic ones up a little more because they have a suspension of little sparkly particles in them I want those mixed up pretty well put you down here dry off my brush Okay. Now we'll see how much of this detail we can make pop. Yeah, it looks pretty good. A little silver. Hopefully by the time I get around to the other end. That purple lightning stuff will be dry. Curves are going to be a little less than perfect because I don't have a small enough brush, but that's all right, we'll get there. Again, ancient artifact. It's been around for many centuries. Does not have to be exactly right. And if one of the players says it doesn't look great, you can say, oh, well, it looks damaged to your character. Maybe there's some damage. And then they say, okay, I want to do some kind of a check to find out why it's damaged. And you're like, all right. And you give them the check and you say, oh, you can't really tell. You're not, you're not skilled enough to know exactly, but maybe it was in some kind of a battle. Let's turn it right back around. <clears throat> so I was going to go over top of this crack. I think I might. Yeah, I think I'll go over top of it. Let's put a big old blob of paint on top. There we go. All right, again, uh, same technique as before. The little strings for the lyre are going to be too tiny for my big fat brush. 
So I'm going to wipe off my little pointy stick. Get it rinsed. Make sure we're not dragging purple anywhere through that. We'll do some little tiny fine lines. I'm going to have to move this slightly. I'm just going to follow the, the groove that I made earlier. That makes it nice and easy. And again, if you mess this part up, then you say, oh, that's the broken string. You write a little backstory about how one of the muses had a broken string, and it's part of the history, and then you're creative genius. Well, that's how we do it. Come in another angle. This will be a little bit easier and faster for you to do at home if you are not pointing a camera at it. Although, I would say, if anybody is... Yes, turn it back on them. Exactly. If anybody is doing any uh, streaming or videos, uh, we would be happy to help send some love your way. Let us know what your streams are about, where we can find them. Every so often I actually have enough time I can actually go watch streams too. So Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, I'm not 100% perfect, but good enough for our purposes. This is all going to have a little bit of a wash on it eventually anyway. So it works out pretty well to spread things around. I'm just, I'm varying the angle of how I hold the tool, which spreads the paint out a little more evenly. And I'm also rotating the tool to get fresh paint on another side when necessary. Okay. I think that is sufficient for our purposes, for our silver paint. All right, now we need to do a uh, We'll show you how to do a wash. While this is drying, we're going to switch back to our previous project, which was the Red Dragon scale. Uh, I want to get a little more of a bend in it eventually, like the other one had, but uh, I want the wash not to spill on this particular mat. So what I would normally do is bend it first and then do the wash. Maybe I'll just go ahead and do it. I'll put a paper towel down. It's no big deal. Prefer not to mess up my board too much, but if you watch other game crafter people on the internet, then uh, you will find out that their boards are messier the better they are. Make sure your wash is super light because you don't have a lot of texture to pick up and end up making it muddy. Very true. Digital Prophet is uh, he paints miniatures quite a lot. I actually have a few of his custom pieces. <clears throat> yeah, super light wash. If it's not dark enough the first time, you can always come back later if you need to, but yeah. You want a good bit of water as compared to paint. Yeah, this particular stuff <clears throat> does not have a lot of texture because it's just flat paper. I mean, it has some on the back here where I'm doing this curvature stuff but in general on the front here all I've got are these little embossed edges which are not going to pop quite as much as say like a bunch of cracks in dried clay or uh, a really detailed resin model miniature something like that oh yeah we forgot our number didn't I have to go back and put that in there That's right, it's acrylic paint. It's very easy to correct mistakes. Okay, let's get a little more curve to it. 
We can make that better later on. All right, for a wash, uh, I'm going to use a brown wash on this one. Um, I think a brown wash fits better with this particular color scheme. Uh, but we'll try it and see what happens. So um, basically what you want to do for a wash, here's my little paint palette thing, is you want to put like a single drop of paint in there to start. And then you want to put in some water. I've got some water over here. Hang on a second. I'll take it off screen and put water in. And what you're looking for is a very runny kind of thing. So this is with a little bit of water into it. Probably need a little more water than this. I'm going to put a little more in. I just want to show you what it's starting off as. And then you stir it up. Let me get a little more water in here. What you can do with washes too is make kind of a bigger batch and store it in like a squeeze bottle, something along those lines. <clears throat> and you can do a big batch of stuff all at the same time. Okay, let's see how our wash has turned out. Let me move some stuff around. Okay, let's start down here. See how we're going. All right. So that's the basic idea, is you're putting on this little bit of brown. It's seeping into cracks, which is where you want it. You want it in all the little cracks. And it will seem pretty light. This is, that will settle in your embossing and make that more visible, but everything else is sort of flat. So yeah, it's gonna run off of this stuff. You won't see it hardly at all on anything else, but we do want it into our flat stuff. Once you've got it down in there, it's settled nicely. Remember that this is paper that you're working with and it will soak through and get warped and weird. So to help prevent that, we're gonna take, after we've got it in there, a little scrap of paper towel. Paper towel. We're gonna pull some of it up. Not quite all of it. Just a little bit. Okay, so you won't be able to see this super well on camera, but it has brought out our embossing just a little bit. That's the basic idea. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more. I'll do sort of a compare and contrast. I'm just concentrating on where my embossed lines are, which you won't even be able to see until we put color on there. I can barely see where they are. Don't run off the edge. There we go. that we'll put a little in here on our sitar make that guy pop out a little more this also helps fix some of our rough edges with the gold paint yeah one of the reasons you want to make a, a big enough batch of wash is because you want it all to be the same consistency and tone for the whole piece because if you have to make a second batch of wash, you're not going to get your ratio exactly the same as the first one. So you may have issues in that way. Okay, now we're going to pull up. I'm pressing straight down and lifting straight up and then finding a new section of the paper to do it. Because I don't want it to sit on there and soak all the way through. I just want to Try not to leave stains anywhere. This one's a little bit of 
color in the end is. Okay. So it's coming out a little bit better. So what I'll do is uh, wait for that to dry. Do the other the rest of it. Wait for that to dry. Come back in with another wash if it looks like it can take a little bit more. Like the number down here can probably take a little bit more. I've sucked too much of it out with my paper towel. But you don't want to oversaturate your paper and soak all the way through. But that's basically the idea behind a wash. For the blue one, uh, we might go a little bit darker since it's a more it's a darker color. I might do a black wash instead of brown uh, to make that pop a little bit differently. Also, we can put in a number there. But here's our two side by side. It's a little hard to see in the zoomed in version. Can miniatures work. So there's our two props. You just need to make uh, six more of those eventually. Put different instruments and things on them like that. All right, let me find a spot for these to dry. I'll be right back. One second. Okay, good work, team. We did it. Uh, so we can go through, do some different colors for each one of them, come up with a little story to go with a lot of that stuff. Uh, where did these scales come from? Were the scales given willingly? Were they taken forcibly? Uh, are the dragons that own them still out there? Did they have something to do with the temple hundreds of years ago? Uh, are they enemies? Are they trying to stop them? You can you can add tons of stuff. Go Team Planet! <laughs> Remember that Don Cheadle? Captain Planet sketch. Oh man. <laughs> Cracks me up. Alright, let me put this paint over here. Alright, a couple other techniques uh, that we can do while I've got my paintbrush out. Um, let me find here my paper towel. I'm gonna sit down a paper towel. Um, Classic, for those of you who, uh, in chat, who do not do a lot of GMing, classic is making scroll paper. And you do it with your coffee or tea. You can do it pretty easily. I've got some tea here, some uh, tea that I overbrewed, left the tea bag in for a little bit longer in the cup than it needs to be. And you can do this with plain paper if you want to. I'm going to show you what it looks like with plain paper. Basically, you tear off a chunk, whatever your final size of your scroll, whatever that you want it to be. I like ripped edges. In uh, ancient days, the way they made actual parchment in the West was uh, it's, it's animal skin, I believe, and it's uh, you scrape it super, super thin and dry it and stretch it and dry it and stretch it and scrape it. And you end up with this crazy sturdy material that you can scratch and write on. It's so sturdy, in fact, that if you make a mistake putting ink onto it, you can scrape it off like an eraser. Really sturdy stuff, still survives to this day. So that's parchment. If you're trying to replicate the look of that, uh, you need something tea colored. Uh, other ancient papers that you can attempt to replicate papyrus, which was woven reeds and they're soaked uh, in Nile water, um, sort of placed together in a sort of a woven kind of pattern, beaten with hammers uh, to the point where it is all together and then you dry it out. And that's papyrus. Not quite as sturdy, but it happened to last a long time in Egypt because it's crazy dry there. So nothing nothing really rots that often. It just crumbles to dust when you take it out into the air. Alright, so I think this is pretty good for a little scroll that we can roll up. I'm gonna paint it with some tea. You can do this with coffee also. Let me show you the color of the tea that I'm working with. It's pretty dark. That's what you're going for because it's going to lighten up as it dries. Coffee will be a little more intense than this, but we're going to try it out. Also, if you're using your paintbrush to paint with tea, don't drink the tea afterwards. 
We'll be drinking paint. It's not fun. So this is a little messy. Let's see how it goes. This is going to be a pretty light brown. But you do want to soak the paper through. It will curl up on you. So you can work on both sides. If you're careful about where your drips go, you can sort of control where you want different stains and markings to be on the paper. This is going to be a really subtle effect because it's tea. But as it dries, the paper will become crunchier than normal, uh, which is a, is a cool textural feature. Uh, after it's dry, you can also crumble it up and uncrumble it to give even more texture. You can do little rips into it. And then finally, the classic, uh, you can scorch the edges with a map. Please be careful, kids. Don't burn your house down. Adult supervision required. Uh, I don't know that there are actually very many historical examples that burned edges of pages happened a lot, but you see them in Dungeons and Dragons quite a bit. It's part of the classic standard fantasy stuff. And if you're going to be a GM, it's sort of a rite of passage. All right. So the paper's getting, it's a little hard to work with one-handed, but it's getting saturated. You can see the contrast between the two sides. It becomes a little more transparent, translucent, I forget, uh, right now, but as it dries, that will probably change a little bit. And again, if you want a stain in a particular spot, I'm curling it up right now so that the T pools in one particular area and if you can arrange your drying rack in such a way that there's a little divot somewhere you can control where those stains go uh, this is the slow tedious way to do this the fast way is to take sheets of paper and a flat shallow baking tray uh, put the tea and or coffee into the baking tray just a little bit get your large pieces of paper in there and uh, soak them all at once. Some people bake them to get the color to set even more firmly. Other people just leave them to soak it up and then take them out and dry them on the rack. You can dry them in the sunlight. Sunlight will change the colors of things, but you can experiment that sort of thing. But yeah, there's, there's sort of a, a quick way to do that. Another uh, very fast way, if you need it done like the same day, uh, get some brown paint. Uh, do a brown wash like we did before uh, do it that way and give you an even darker stain than this if you're out of tea bags uh, you can also take very light brown paint like a beige or something like that and do a little bit of uh, dry brushing that's where you get most of the paint off of the brush uh, and then do a little bit of dry brushing on the thing to make it work okay so after this is done you will end up with a crunchy slightly brown piece of paper uh, that you can then write on in your best calligraphy and you will also have an undrinkable tea which gets put away right now okay you go down here find a spot for this guy Ugh. okay what's left if you remember from our adventure uh some of the locations that we talked about we have the town square where they may get into an impromptu fight uh we have things like the uh the heartbreak inn uh which they're doing some role playing in but then they're doing some adventuring down at the cellar so we can come up with some stuff to put down in there for scatter terrain uh we've got the dungeon itself which has a little temple uh into it and some things like that um, we've got lots of underground passages. We've got the mayor's mansion, 
uh, where the mass grave ball is being held. So lots of locations. So think about that. What's going to be the most effective use of your um, time in terms of making props? So I'm going to show you a couple of really basic GM techniques. Again, there's lots of other people making stuff online. This is a good primer, though. And we're going to use good old craft sticks, popsicle sticks, to make some stuff. Um, and I'll just show you the, the very, very basics of what you're going to do. First of all, you want to think about scale if you're using miniatures at all. Here's um, sort of things to scale so you can start visualizing. We're using a one inch grid here. Lots of people go gridless. Uh, I can't really see my horse so that well. Let me get him over here. This is an elf miniature, a dwarf miniature, and a horse figurine, uh, which I picked up, I think, at a craft store. They have a bunch of horse figures. Uh, so that gives you a sense of scale. So if we're, let's make a table. That's nice, easy, square kind of thing. So if you're thinking about a, a, a small table, it would be about, like a, like a cafe style table would be like one of these squares, so about one inch uh, in diameter. If you're looking for, um, let's say, something like that would be appropriate for uh, let's say a tavern table kind of a thing maybe a little bit wider for a dining table in a mansion I think that's what we're possibly going to make is, is uh, either I think we might make the dining table at the mansion so let me show you how to do that that would be pretty easy okay, so let's scoot you guys off to the edge here so you're still in the frame and have our space to work with. All right, so I'm going to work with just some basic popsicle sticks, super cheap, uh, pretty easy to use, and we're essentially going to glue them up and make our little table, and then I'll show you uh, some ways to, to decorate it. So one of the things you can do uh, is rough up this texture a little bit. Uh, if you have um, uh, like a metal brush, like steel wool, or uh, like a metal shop brush kind of thing. You can definitely rough up the texture if you want it to have a little more texture to it. That's a nice technique. I'm not going to worry about it right now. Uh, so these will cut with heavy scissors pretty easily if you're I'm trying to be fairly careful so I don't shoot it across the room. So just like that. I'm just going to take the edges off just the round bits. just like that and you'll end up with some rough edges that you can then sand if you want to in the interest of time I'm going to skip that step and uh, let's do a couple more of these so we have a nice table surface I get to collect all these little bits later on there's two You can keep the little pieces if you want to use them for later projects. The folks who do tabletop crafting on the regular have bins and bins of little bits and pieces of stuff they've collected to uh, use however they wish. Okay, so here's our essentially our tabletop. We need to join it together somehow. Uh, these are not perfectly even. So for something like a mayor's mansion or something like that, uh, these are probably kind of, uh, you'd have to put some trim onto them. Uh, but we could use it potentially for 
the heartbreak in if we made it a little smaller. So what I'm thinking is this will be our roughly the size of a, a long table. And then you could fit you know, four adventurers on both sides, an adventure on either end of it. Then you have a nice big party of up to ten if you wanted. Maybe your horse friend is there. They don't have horse characters yet in the Indy Japan, and they added some races with some of the unextra cameras and stuff. But all right, so how do we join these together? And just like in real life, uh, we need to put some sort of cross pieces on the underside. So look at your look at your bits and see uh, which ones you want facing up. If there's any interesting stuff going on, you know, those pointing upwards. See what order you want them in. I want them to be a little jagged on the edges because the heartbreak is not a really fine establishment like the mayor's mansion. And then we're going to uh, very quickly measure, measure and mark where we need our braces to go. So you can do like a cross piece like this if you wanted to. That's sort of the quick and easy way. Uh, you can also do some pieces like this, which is what I think we will do today. So just kind of mark, you want a little bit less than the full length. Of, or the full width of your table, rather. And then you're gonna cut right there with some heavy scissors. If you don't have really heavy scissors, you can also uh, score it with an X-Acto knife or another knife, and then sort of wiggle it back and forth and snap it off. And then clean up your edges with uh, sandpaper if you need to. Especially if you're playing with little kids, you're going to handle this stuff. So there's one of our cross pieces. Now we want another one of those. Just marking where that goes. Try and get this into the shot. Very careful so we don't shoot it across the room. There we go. All right, we stay here. If you like, you can do hot glue for speed. You can do super glue if you are a wealthy person, or you can do straight up school glue if you don't mind waiting a bit, which. I got nothing else to do today, so. <laughs> so once I get my glue to come out, it's an old glue bottle, so it's gonna take a minute. There it goes. Spread it around. Get it stuck to your finger a few times. So you know it's made with love. Give it lined up and stick it on there. Obviously, these are not going to be the sturdiest things in the world. So you may want a couple more cross pieces in there. You may, may want to use some better glue than what I'm using. If you intend for these to be used heavily or often, which if you're going to the trouble of making something for your games and you want to use it more often, start thinking about that now. Like, for example, you could use a table in many, many kinds of games. So it would be something that's maybe worth spending a little extra time on and then decorating. So what I'm doing is uh, you push it down and then give it a little bit of a wiggle to spread the glue around to the edges. I'm going to hold this here for just a minute while it uh, soaks into the wood and then we'll have our little wood piece. Okay, but that's our tabletop for our uh, table for the inn. Uh, there's a couple ways you could do table legs. Uh, you could definitely make them out of more popsicle sticks if you wanted to. I happen to have some little tiny uh, dowels. A dowel is a circular wooden piece that I'm going to use. So I'm going to cut off a couple of sections for that. And we're going to uh, glue it into place. 
as that glue dries. So let me cut off a few pieces here. So I'm going to use my little measuring thing since I've got this board out. I'm going to use a tummy measure. Let's see if I can clean this up where you guys can see it too. Okay. Let's do it at about an inch high would make might be a little high for these guys so maybe half an inch and I'm just gonna eyeball it I'll put a little mark roughly where I want to do my cuts And again, you can spend more time than I'm spending. This is just demo. If you've never seen it before, then uh, you should definitely give it a try. Okay, for these guys, in order to make these cuts, since this is a little bit thicker, what I'm going to do is press pretty firmly and slowly rotate as I make cuts. So I'm, for the different wood fibers, I'm cutting in from the outside of the wood fibers, and then eventually it. So the caves on you. What I'm going for here is something that looks rustic and uneven. So for this particular table, it does not matter if they are perfect. I would almost prefer if they were not. So that my, sorry, my hand shot. So that my, uh, table is a little wobbly, which would be appropriate for a downtrodden end in need of help. So this works really well. And then if I were doing a table in the mayor's mansion, I would want that to be a little more refined. I might put a couple extra details on it, little edges and things. All right, we've got our four little pieces. So you would want to clean these up perhaps with a little bit of uh, sandpaper to make them flush and flat. I'm just going to use my finger down here because I forgot my sandpaper in the other room. So we'll just make do. And then they are roughly the same size. This one's going to be a little bit bigger than the other guys. But that's okay. So I think that'll make a more interesting table. All right, so there's our little pieces, which may be out of focus slightly for my camera. Let's find out. All right, let's glue them on. Uh, this is still pretty delicate. We don't want to mess with it too much. Uh, in fact, I might put a cross piece on here just to give it one more anchor point. So what I'm looking for is something that would go like that. And then we'll have just one more way to keep it together. Because I would like it, if I'm going to spend time making it, I would like it to last at least one game session. Yeah. You can get some tweezers or something if you really want to make this stuff more precise. Most of my game props were sort of cardboard creations. And uh, I did that for quite a while. It's perfectly serviceable. You don't have to go crazy. So I do not have the steadiest of hands. But generally, you want to get it in there. Use whatever your flattest side is, perhaps. I don't know if you guys can see this all that well. I'm holding it a little wrong. There's another one. Um, hot glue makes this significantly uh, easier also because the glue spreads out and uh, holds things in place kind of like a gel. 
super glue sticks very quickly when you can do that it is a little expensive in my opinion so I usually don't bother but there's a little table legs to represent our table I, I go for more symbolism than I go for uh, perfect accuracy but there's that little guy so obviously I'm not going to mess with that too much right now because this is school glue it will take quite a while to dry came back and we're doing some black magic craft oh yeah that's one of my favorites he's been he's been making a lot of stuff my character flips the table for cover exactly that's why you put props in a room famous example one of my uh eastern style games with ninjas and samurais in it uh the first room they go to in an inn had a giant walk that was the inn's claim to fame it was a giant cooking walk where they made all the food in front of everyone in the middle of the common room in the inn and so obviously the first bar fight that happens you have to throw some bad guys into the walk because it's there so any props that you give to your players are going to be useful to them they will be looking for them they need to use terrain uh, they, some of them want to anyway all right so that's our little table while that's drying uh, let's say that you only have you know a couple of hours to devote to your prop making and you need that table to function in the inn and you also need that table to function uh, at the mayor's mansion as the is the main dining table in the dining hall so in order to accommodate that uh, we're going to make a little tablecloth for it. So let's measure the guy here. So I'm thinking we make a, a, we'll make a tablecloth and a table runner. A runner is a strip of cloth that goes down uh, the center of the table. So for this particular one, if you'll remember, it is uh, four inches long, one inch wide, and then you have half an inch of uh, a table leg to work with there. So we want to cover up most of that, so we're going for, we want there to be a little bit of an overhang around the edge of this for our, our table. So fortunately, I've got this nice measuring grid right here, my work surface. So the table itself, oh, there's some stuff around here. Yeah. Slide over, guys. Need space. Guard the table. So I want it to be uh, about, maybe have like a quarter inch, almost a half an inch of overhang, but not quite touching the ground. Uh, so instead of the four inches long and one inch wide, we want four plus a quarter plus a quarter, so we want four and a half long. So one, two, three, four and a half. And then we want, I point the right side, okay. Uh, one inch width of table with a little bit of an overhang, quarter inch, quarter inch. So we want one inch plus two quarter inches is another half. So we want this to be one and about a half inches. Let me line this up and make some straight line markings so that we can cut our paper appropriately. I'm just eyeballing this. You can use a ruler if you want to, but I don't think my players are going to pay tremendous attention. All right, so there's our little pattern that we have. I'm going to just cut it out. Uh, the paper that I'm using for this is not, sorry, I'm trying to get it in the camera here, is not standard copy paper. This is a little bit heavier duty paper. Uh, what you want to look for is uh, cardstock, if you can find cheap cardstock somewhere, um, or any kind of heavier weight paper. So um, I think standard paper is like 60 or 90 or something like that, and um, maybe 120, I forget. In this particular cardstock, I've actually got it over here. Let me look. Let me read the thing.
Okay. This particular card stock is a is 120. So I guess regular stuff's probably 60. Uh, so look for the weight of the paper. If you need heavier paper, you're looking for weight. So here's our little uh, our guy. It will uh, overhang a bit on the different edges. So I'm going to mark where I want to make my folds. So this is this will be the underside. This will be the hidden side of the thing. Again, it's not perfectly perfect. Let's see if you guys can see this. Okay. So I'm just uh, my pin will decide to function here, so you can see. I'm just going to mark roughly. It does not have to be great about where these folds are going to be. And then we'll get as close as we can to make a cool little tablecloth. All right, so essentially uh, you might want to use a straight edge for this to make it super easy on yourself. You put your straight up edge up against that line. You're going to fold it hard on the straight edge. Fold it over and then run your fingernail or something hard against it. Give you a nice crisp fold. Again, you probably want to measure a little more accurately than I'm doing. But... So this way, we will have a little tablecloth to put over top of our rustic table to make it look like a fine dining table. Two for one. Less things to carry to game. Uh, you can hide mistakes if you have these little covers. There's a guy online who makes um, crafts out of uh, paper exclusively. Uh, well, not exclusively, but he, he embellishes all of his crafts with printed paper stuff. I think his name now. I have to look it up. Uh, to get these corners to work correctly, uh, we may have to do a little bending and folding. I'll show you in a second how to do that. There's, you can either cut them or you can um, you can fold them. I think we can probably get away with folding them. So let me get as straight as I can with my little straight edge here. Now these longer ones, of course, are harder to bend. Well, it's fighting back a little bit more. But if you have a little straight edge, you can make it work. And again. If you are playing games, especially with the younger crowd with kids, uh, they may respond especially well to miniatures and terrain stuff. They like the more board gamey aspects of things. Okay, so you see here now that our, our fold is complete, we have this little corner that doesn't want to cooperate. So on an actual tablecloth, what you do is you pitch that little bit in there. Let's see if you can see that. And we're pinching the two edges together, like so. And kind of squeeze it semi-flat, like so. So you end up with a shape like, roughly like that. Let's try and repeat that over on the other edges, so. Again, we're squeezing. We're squeezing, and we're flattening. Squeezing, flattening. So obviously for this particular thing, if you do not like the uh, drawing and painting kind of stuff, you will want to decorate your tablecloth before you start your folding. Uh, 
same with um, any of your foldable projects. You probably want to do the majority of the artwork first and fold it later. What's handy to me though is having the folds. I can unfold it and then draw. So it's not that big of a deal. So let's assume that this is dry. I'm going to be real careful. Try not to break my table legs. So here's our little table that we made. Yep, not perfect. I'll get my sandpaper out in a little while to make sure that that goes a little more even. Uh, let me turn it this way, actually. There we go. You can see that pretty well. And then if we've measured correctly, which I'm sure we are not exactly right, um, this then would fit over top of the table, and that would be a little tablecloth, and we could decorate it however we want. Two for the price of one. You got a dining table in the mayor's mansion. Take it off. You get yourself a regular uh, rustic inn table. Uh, so let's do a table runner. Same general principle, except this time I'll decorate it. Let's slide you over a bit. Let's put you here. We already know our measurements. I just need to find my paper. Uh, having the having the cardstock, by the way, is will what help it will help keep this a little more sturdy, so it doesn't get bent up in your bag. So I have my table runner to run roughly in in the center here, and uh, I want it to be about this big in terms of width, but longer. So we have our measurement here. I'm just going to use this as a template because it's fast and easy. Put it roughly here. And I'm going to sort of mark where I want to make my cut. Again, you do not have to be super precise if you're going to cover it all up with paint or ink or colored pencils or whatever it is that you like to draw with. If you're really fancy, you can get one of those uh, paper cutting machines. That would be pretty awesome. I'm going to give myself some overhang here so we can decide how long we want our little table runner to go. And now again, you can, uh, you can get some versatility out of this because if you make one tablecloth, let's say you make a red one, or a blue one or whatever, whatever the color you want, one tablecloth and then uh, different table runners for different, let's say, houses. Let's say, play a Game of Thrones game or something like that. Different houses have different colored table runners. Okay, this is a pretty decent length. So I'm just going to hold where I want my bins to be. Bend them like so. And fold them over. Not super precise. Doesn't have to be. Make some adjustments as we go. And then there's your little table runner. And then I'm going to give it a little bit of a. You can do a little bit of fringe or something if you wanted to. Let's see if I can get this on here. Make little, I'm going to cut little 45 degree angle triangles out of it. To make it fancy. a little bit. You can always make corrections because the stuff bounces back pretty easily into cardstock. Uh, I got my cardstock at Walmart. I know they have carry some in the regular paper section. So there's our little table runner. Uh, now we can decorate it. So I'll flatten it back out. Now that we've got it marked where all the stuff is going to be, let me find my... Let's see where I put my markers. I'm just going to do this one in 
markers instead of paint or something like that because it's a little bit quicker since you're working with paper the advantage of paper is of course that uh, you can use all kinds of markers and crayons and things on it so I'm going to use this fine tip yellow marker. Let's see how this turns out. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm going to give myself some golden edges all around my table runner. Uh, you probably won't be able to see that super well unless my focus decides to behave a little bit better, but yeah, you can see that a little bit. So yeah, don't bust yourself if you don't have to. If you can make a single object that serves four or five different purposes, that is the ideal. And then you just bring the dressing. So for this particular adventure, I would make the octave scale props. I'd make those because that's sort of the that's the hook that gets them into the main body of our plot. I would make probably a couple of props for the Heartbreak Inn because they're headquartered there. They might have several adventures there. So maybe some stuff at the common room, uh, tables, stools, maybe a bar, something like that. I would keep in mind that uh, I would make the base object and then try and use the same object to for other things with some different dressing on it. For example, a wooden box kind of thing can be the bar. It could be um, crates in a dockyard. It could be a bunch of different things. You just have to dress it up differently or paint it differently. Save yourself some time. Uh, what else would I make? When they get down to the uh, temple and the dungeon, one of our puzzles has a bunch of little uh, statuettes. If I were going to make those, I would make them out of either little uh, circles of paper, little little rounds of paper, or cardboard, or um, maybe even modeling clay. Okay, so there's a little yellow fringe. I put the yellow one first because I'm going to put some, some red, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's maybe blue maybe blue if we're gonna do blue we can do some other stuff too actually um this is evie nix's family is throwing this no wait actually it's the uh i'm wrong it's the um it's the bread to the bones family we might make him green green might be cool Let's, let's do a little, I'll do a little figurine here though. So it's so small it's not going to show up hardly at all. So I'm just going to do a little sketch of what I think the outline of a griffin might look like. And then I'll copy it. Alright, that's our yellow marker. Yeah, I think red. Red will pop pretty well. That was my original thought anyway, it was red. So the nice thing about fine tip markers is you can get right up to the very edges of things. Just filling in. We'll bleed a little bit on you, so watch out for that. But everything's a miniature. Small mistakes disappear. Most of your players are going to be sitting far enough away from the table that they will miss all the little teeny tiny details. 
but they will appreciate that you tried. You made an effort. If you have a thicker marker, you can use it on these larger sections. I have one somewhere, but I don't feel like finding it right now. I could probably do a whole series on just making game props and stuff. It's a pretty relaxing time. Show it around lunchtime. If people need uh, something to watch while they're, while they're eating lunch. And you show it around bedtime. You can do soothing stories of old role-playing games. While we paint carriages and stuff. And then we'll do the other little end and we'll try it out, see what it looks like. Again, there are many other online crafters who have lots of different techniques you can learn. I think the first time I found DM Scotty's channel, I ended up watching several hours a day for probably a couple of weeks to get through his library of stuff that he had already built at that point, and that was years ago. He may have even more now. Okay, there's our little thing. You can go around the outside edge too, just a little bit if you wanted to make it even pop a little bit more. Like so. Just sort of brushing against the outer edge with red. It really looks like we have the gold is like an embroidery on top of the red, just along the edge. Fine tip marker is very handy when you're working with paper. Small brushes are very handy when you're working with miniatures and doing detail work. If you can find one, get yourself either a like single hair brush or make one out of an older little paintbrush by trimming away everything but basically a single good hair in the middle. good way to do lots of little detail work or you can slap it together and make something pretty crude depending on how much effort you want to put onto it all right and then here's our table runner for our tablecloth I you could go with like a blue tablecloth or a green tablecloth or something like that if you wanted to have a little contrast in there but that's basically that so there we go. There's a little table runner for the mayor's mansion scene, uh, the diving hall uh, during the ballroom blitz section where we have masquerade balls occurring at the mayor's mansion. And uh, this next door to where the action would be is having one of these. Might be handy if the players need cover, as uh, Dan plays we are suggested. Kicking over the table. That's good cover. All right. That's essentially what we've got today. We're coming up on 1.30. Uh, let me put the web address of our campaign back up. So we didn't add a lot this week, but next week, um, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, the show comes back pre-holidays. I believe that what we're going to be doing is cleaning up the work that we have I've been learning a lot from our other stream, which happens on Tuesdays. Uh, Kalak Codes, he's teaching CSS for Obsidian Portal. I've picked up a couple of tricks that I want to try 
and uh, make some cool additions to what we already have for our first adventure. We're going to make it nice and sparkly and look good and have lots of images and all of our links are correct. Cool cleanup work there. Uh, doing some custom stuff. Stuff I've learned from his stream. His stream is Tuesday nights, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. That's GMT minus 5 now, I think, because we're daylight savings. Well, I don't know how it works, but... Uh, just Google it if you need the actual time. <laughs> that's what's going on there. After that, we have the holidays coming up, so we might have an adjusted schedule. I'll, I'll try and mention on the next stream what that's going to be. And then we've got our first adventure finished. You can go to liveryordiebar.obsidianportal.com and read about our current work, our adventure, and uh, if you would like to run it yourself, all the information is there. You can run it straight off of OP. You can make yourself your own account if you want. Invite your players and just copy what I've got over to your stuff and you'll be good to go. Or just run it straight off of mine. I don't mind. Whatever you want to do. It's free. So, thank you for being here. Thank you, chat. Appreciate you tuning in and showing up. Hopefully we'll see you next week. And that's all for me for today. Thanks. See you later.